Long time no talk, I'm back. That was great. It was like Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood doorbell sound. Ding dong. Yeah, Zoom's a, Zoom's a classic. So we'll know in just a moment if things are recording well. Oh, now I see your name on Zoom, M Doggy Dog. Yes, sir. That is a good username. That won't show up in the final recording. Don't worry. But as long as you retain it. I'll retain it, and I may throw my mention of it here, somewhere in the middle of the show. <laughs> I welcome that. <laughs> but that's it. We'll, we'll make sure it doesn't show up visually. I want the framing to have my, my row of cameras that the... Oh, that's such a nice row of cameras. So, uh, without any further ado, hold on, hold on. me to introduce you. Well, wait, but hold on. Further ado. Okay, I'm fine okay. with further ado. There actually is further ado, because I need to grab the second uh, Negroni that I made on deck for this moment. Amazing, please do. Uh, welcome to Further Ado with Steve Morocco, where I'm waiting for Mick, who you can't see because I'm talking, but he's currently standing in shorts in his kitchen. That's me. Uh, <laughs> oh, there you go. There he is. I'm waiting for Mick to grab the second Negroni. Do you have it? Sir? To further ado. <laughs> to further ado. <laughs> wow. Okay, so Mick is my best friend from elementary school and uh, current friend as well. But I don't know how else to describe you. But uh, Yeah, I could, I could. Okay, so here. How else to describe Mick, me? Mick and, I, Mick and I bonded over. This is important. Pay attention. Uh, Mick and I bonded over a video game called The Elder Scrolls Three. Morrowind. Now, many of you who claim to be nerds at one point probably played Oblivion or Skyrim. Y'all don't know shit, all due respect. The original, important, the only Elder Scrolls that really mattered, and to this day, one of the greatest video games ever made, uh, Morrowind, the Elder Scrolls 3. And it was an incredible video game because of this reason. It had terrible graphics. It had the ability to run on Windows, which in and of itself was a miracle. And it also had, I think, one of the most in-depth storylines and well-told stories of any video game ever made up until that point. It was incredible. It's a work of art. And in fact, it has so inspired the people who care deeply about this video game that to this day, in 2020, there are people remaking that video game every couple years in the latest graphics from scratch with the complete storyline, and you can play it on any modern equipment with, with great graphics now, the whole game, as it was originally designed. There are just people who care enough about it to do that in their free time. And this is no small feat because it is a 16 square mile area. I used to have maps of it up in my office. It was an incredible game. Mick is the human who introduced me to that game. Mick. <laughs> well... I'm really glad Steve invited me to his paid Bethesda ad. <laughs> I am personally grateful to be a part of it. I completely agree with Steve. That game is phenomenal. I'm really grateful for the shout out to the people who are currently modding this game to match <laughs> modern graphics. And honestly, it wouldn't be great if we were just playing Morrowind for a living. Oh, dude, it would. I, Unfortunately, I, we're not playing Morrowind for a living. We're on this cool Zoom call. It's 2020 yeah. and it's supper time. Steve, I decided to put on this sweater and this button down. Wow. I didn't know for a while about the difference between button up and button down. I feel like people use these interchangeably, but one might know. You may know. Your listening audience may also know. But a button up is a shirt that has buttons, much like this has, and you button it up. A button down is the button down collar, which has buttons. <laughs> and... A coworker of mine said, you can never wear the button-down collar and just unbutton the buttons. But here we are, because this, this is a new era. <laughs> well, I appreciate your cultural paradigm shift. That's great. I, I feel like that will fit well in our Bethesda ad. Is there anything else you feel like our, our viewers should know about you as we... Mick is also a lawyer in Portland. He does law things. There's a bio below that's extremely detailed. And recently, we've bonded over our shared love of crazy entrepreneurship things like selling watches, starting ISPs, perhaps magazines, uh, etc. Are there other things that are worth mentioning? Well, I definitely can just quickly give a little series of events. So Steve and I met in Colorado. Like, yeah. Which is up. What happened? <laughs> what happened that we, that we ended up so beautiful? <laughs> yes. How did we get? I mean, to me, that's a shock. Having in my possession photos of us in our younger third grade years, 
who knew that we would become such male models? <laughs> that being said, what happened was I was in Colorado for a few years, moved back to New Mexico from whence I hail, <laughs> um, and went to middle school, high school, and college in New Mexico. In 2012, decided I was going to move up to Portland, Oregon, for the sole purpose of pursuing my folk music career. And yeah. you can tell by the outfit I'm wearing that I did it. It was a radical success. It was a radical success, but it was so successful that I said, all right, I think I'm going to go to law school. But, but between... As all, as all successful folk musicians. Right. That's why Bob Dylan has why. Yeah, I mean, once you peak as a folk musician, there's nothing to do but go to law school. You got to make room for the others, the, the, you know, the, the up and comers. So actually between this meteoric folk career and my becoming a corporate attorney, what I decided was I would become a political consultant. So I worked in politics for a number of years okay. and a number of candidates for state office, for local city offices, county offices, et cetera. Did a number of legislative advocacy projects, passing all sorts of interesting, fun legislation, or at least trying. And now... I work at a wonderful law firm here in Portland, Oregon, and I get to sit here on this beautiful day in my quarantine home talking to Steve, you beautiful man. Hooray, hooray. And that is how we became male models in Portland and Colorado. A great backstory. So to get us started, to get us started, I need to understand these cameras that are in your kitchen. What's going on there? There's a lot of cameras, and I'm the photographer here. Why do you have all the cameras? I will gladly tell you, but speaking of cameras, I just want to say that this is the first time I've been in a video interview. Yeah. And so I keep doing the, the, the GIF, the GIF, I'm, you know, graphics, yeah. sure. that, is, that is Leonardo DiCaprio and The Great Gatsby. I keep doing it because I can't come up with a more creative move, so I keep going. And so that is something I need to work on. I feel like maybe we should somehow integrate that into the video. I'm not sure that I can final edit that in, but I can try. What I just did or the actual? Well, the actual oh, video. You can't integrate me into the video. It's going to be a one-sided conversation. You gotta put the original so people know what you're talking about. Let's have a moment of silence for me to put that gif right here. Ready? What sound do you suppose that gif makes? Um, like clink. Okay. Let's <clears throat> with big with big band jazz in the background. <laughs> oh yeah. Here we go. Now, hold on, I've got to get the big band jazz then. Hold just one moment. Okay. Yeah. Do the big band jazz. I will be ready to do my Leonardo DiCaprio, which and then we'll put the gif up, and that'll be that. Very good. Two hours of big band. Two hours of that GIF. Hold on. <laughs> Non-stop. Yeah, there we go. There we go. That was so good. That was great. I'm really glad. Can we submit this to the Oscars? <laughs> uh, I don't know that that would be fair. I agree. It would All be, of the yeah. other submissions. Yeah, that's true. Okay. Now so, I need to hear the story of the cameras. The cameras. There's a gentleman I work with at the law firm, and he had sent an email out to sort of our, our main listserv. And he said, hey, I have all these old cameras, a mixture of Polaroids and Kodaks. And they, I mean, these are anywhere from 10 years old to probably 70 years old. And I'm happy to grab, grab one. I actually have one that I'd love to showcase here because it's so bulky. And he said, hey, you know, is anybody looking to purchase these? And I guess there was some confusion about what was going on and, and who would end up purchasing which one. And so after a while, I, I emailed him and I said, hey, if you, know, if you have one of these left over after the, the big rush on them, let me know. And then he said, you know what, you can just have them all. <laughs> so I ended up with this kind of grocery tote bag full of a lot of different cameras, but I just want to highlight two really briefly. Yeah, let's go so over it. Now your wonderful listening audience will see that while That's I'm not true. I can make sure to talk while out. you walk to your kitchen. It's all party on bottom. It really is all party. The red shorts go nicely with the, the blue sweater. That's what I always say. That's <laughs> what, it's what I always used to time. say as well. It's a... It's a, okay. a so. class. Now that your whole audience got the very, very sensual walk. So this one is a Polaroid. It's a Polaroid 450 automatic land camera, which I guess is it's a not a water camera. one. So haven't dipped it. Not a water camera. It's um, a water camera. 
It's just it's just so bulky and incredible. It says electronic timer here on the back. Yeah. I mean, this whole accordion thing is fascinating. I just find it fabulous and phenomenal. And I don't even know if it works, but we should talk about this. So at least I can wow. look like a pretty cool guy. Uh, dude, yeah, that's amazing. Have you looked any of these up on eBay? <laughs> no, I haven't. But we should do that. But also, in case you needed to hire a really slick spy to take a photo with a less aggressive camera, don't worry. Less aggressive. Oh, wow. Slick. That's this is awesome. called the Vivitar Tele 603. Oh, uh, yes. A classic as well. Mm, a classic. So I love these cameras, although I've had a couple guests come over and say, that's kind of weird. I feel like I'm being watched. So maybe <laughs> I need to rework the aesthetic. Yeah, maybe if they were mounted differently. They all are all pointed at your front door, are they not? I mean, that's more my bedroom. I live in what's called a hybrid studio, oh, okay. which means that there's three walls around my bed instead of two or four. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> math is not my greatest strong suit, but imagine a normal studio apartment. You yeah. have four walls yeah. and everything inside of it. <laughs> hybrid studio you insert an extra couple walls in there so that the bedroom essentially is a bedroom but it doesn't have a fourth wall with a door ah uh, gotcha okay cool yeah when you said two walls i was very confused what kind of homes you've been i mean it's just like playing the sims <laughs> take two walls in your bed there you want to put them do people still play the sims i hope so i think so i think most people play animal crossing now you have Animal Crossing in here? I have Animal Crossing, and it is so delightful. It, it is just dumb. Everyone goes like... <laughs> but somehow, it feels like heartwarming. It's no more wind, but it is pretty great. It is. It is so, so good. And Steve and I played Animal Crossing. I actually have a very distinct memory of being in your home, in your childhood home. There was this sort of... Was that like a lounge room upstairs right by the... the if you went left from the staircase, was there a big green crush in it? Yeah, with the, yeah, with the GameCube. Yeah. Okay. Or the, yeah, well, the that was, I guess, the library. There's a huge bookshelf in there, so we. Call it was it. the library. Yeah. Um, the library of memories, beautiful memories, where Steve and I would play Animal Crossing, and I actually do remember distinctly our Animal Crossing obsession. That's awesome. That was the OG Animal Crossing, wasn't it? I think that was. The it was, and that came GameCube. out in check it, two thousand one. <sighs> Wow, and I have to say that Nintendo didn't really do great updates on the graphics, but that's okay. Nintendo, <laughs> I love and appreciate you. It's less about the graphics. If it was about the graphics, I'd be playing Cyberpunk 2077. That's funny. The Yeah, no, the graphics are identical. They just render the very low poly count really, really accurately now. It's like high res, low poly. And honestly, like, given that it's a bunch of weird, like, kind of munchkins with animal heads, you may not necessarily want like crisp this is a this is an uncanny valley let me get worse <laughs> yeah yeah and, and god knows where we're gonna end up so i prefer the cartoon whole you know kind of wholesome vibes that emanate from my nintendo switch i agree completely so as someone who has yet to play the new animal crossing um do you mind if i ask you a few questions about what that cultural experience is like I love that that was like a CIA interrogation style question about Animal Crossing. And Let me swing the overhead light first. So, where were you on the night that you first got Animal Crossing? <laughs> in, in my apartment. Crazy, I know. How did you get the game if you were just in your apartment? It's funny you ask that. I use the internet. Oh. What's, what's curious about Animal Crossing... You're saying someone that I should be interviewing delivered it to you. Maybe they're the person I should ask. The this internet right. delivered it to me. <laughs> Say it's not. Part is, Nintendo had to big, deliver a big old patch for the game oh. before it even released. Wow. And so they said, they being, I don't know, my friends said, download the game, pre-order. So if you pre-order it, it downloads automatically, but you can't start the game until the release date because that's the, that's the state of technology these days. Amazing. So what, what, I feel like you had other good Animal Crossing questions in mind. Oh, I definitely do. So, first of all, what was the moment that you decided to buy Animal Crossing in 2020? The moment that I realized a new Animal Crossing game was coming out for a mainstream, non-portable platform. I mean, the Switch 
is both portable and non-portable. Well, it's always portable. I guess it can't be both. But you can play it on the go, or you can plug it into your sweet, sweet HD TV. Play it. I haven't played Animal Crossing since 2001, largely because I never bought a, a DS. I never bought a Wii, which is not a portable game system, but nonetheless didn't buy it. So now it was time for me to step back in. And it was called Animal Crossing New Horizons. And they're on, you're, you're on an island. Come on, who doesn't want to right now, in the current state of our world, get right sweet into an island? That sounds like Animal Crossing. You're not wrong. I, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. I'm just... <laughs> I love this. I was wondering if you, did you ever play the phone version? No, because that's even more portable than a DS. It's incredibly portable. I, Yeah, that's the last time I played Animal Crossing. And it took me a full, like, several weeks, actually, before I realized, oh, there we go. I love those, those wonderful poly, polytone noises. Pocket camp. Pocket camp. Time to start. Okay, there's a half gig update, so that's where we quit. See, so that's weeks, where we are. It took me weeks to realize that that is not what people are talking about. This is a brand new version of Animal Crossing, New Horizons. Wow, you just admitted that publicly. So, <laughs> yeah, I did. So once I realized that, I immediately went to Amazon.com, the great internet store of things, and I looked up... Also an Amazon ad. Yeah, and I looked up... The two editions, I'm very confused and I don't know what to do and I need your help figuring out what to purchase. So there's a thing called a portable switch, a switch portable or something like Light. That. Yeah, that. What is that and how is it different from the other one that has Animal Crossing colors? Half the price. Oh, well, okay. So I think we're dealing about we're dealing with a multitude of options here. Yeah, we're dealing, yeah. Just You can buy a normal switch. Just think about it as the... The foundational beautiful switch, which brought... It's like GameCube. Just, it has red and blue handles. Yes. Cool. Then you have the Animal Crossing, like, branded switch. <laughs> yeah, which, I mean, if I'm going to buy a whole switch, that's the one I'm going to buy, right? Same price. Right. And or, and I need to emphasize the and and the or, because it may be or, that beautifully branded Animal Crossing switch is the Switch Lite, which I believe is a smaller switch. Oh. But... Okay, here's the impression I got. So I think the Animal Crossing Switch is a full Switch. Okay. It's $500. Then, okay. Then, so right. all the rest of the Switches. Then there's the Switch Lite, which comes in like blue and yellow and gray or pink, right? Oh, gray. Colors. Maybe I should buy the gray one. No one bought the gray one, I guarantee it. No. Um, and it appears to just be like a Game Boy. Yeah? So. The, the, yeah, I believe. Well, I'm not sure the dimensions. <laughs> I know that that's dimensions. I think it's that you can't plug it into your TV. Does that sound right? Oh my god! So there's no dock. It's just the mobile thing. I think that's what's up. My reaction was so intense. It's like I just like you know. My I'm god! Like going to war. <laughs> um, it's not so. You can't plug it into your. How much do you play? No! Um, <laughs> they can't be real, and if it is real, don't buy it. You really think it's that it's worth plugging it into your TV? It's two hundred and fifty dollars worth of plugging it into your TV. Well, how much is the other one? Uh, it's two hundred and fifty versus five hundred. No, but a normal switch is two hundred and fifty. What? I think you're comparing the Switch Lite, which according to you is two fifty, and the Animal Crossing Switch, which is getting a a market increase for its collectability value. No, well, because normal switches are also five hundred. No, they aren't. <laughs> now we both go to our internet. Let's internet off. <laughs> Switch prices. Nintendo. Do you have any idea why Animal Crossing? Oh, I'm is sorry. So Two ninety nine. Yeah. So three forty four thirty nine five fourteen. Normal switches are five hundred dollars. What are you talking about, bud? If you just go to Oh, wait, Nintendo Switch prices at Amazon source 62% as price gougers prey on desperate shoppers. Do you want to be a desperate shopper, Steve? <laughs> yes, that is me. I am a desperate shopper. Okay, well, if you do, then you can pay the crazy astronomical prices that you're listing. Yeah, but okay, there's a Switch Lite that's only 250 Yeah, but it's like a Game Boy. Do you remember when we would hang out in your room? And, don't worry, this isn't going anywhere weird. And uh, we had those lights that you could put over the Game Boy screens. 
Dude, yeah, it was so hard to play Game Boys in the dark in the early back the screens. People take backlights nowadays. Backlights are no joke, dude. I know. Where was Tim Cook? So important. And those Game Boys just didn't. They fully didn't have backlights. And it you was remember that? You also remember that? Plug it in, and it would like hang over the screen. You could never aim it right, and sometimes the plug would die because the whole structure was supported by like a shitty USB. It's, it's 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 a it's a flaw waiting to happen. Do you remember the Game Boy Printer? The who? The yeah, oh, the Game you- Boy Printer. Game Boy Printer. We <laughs> had one of these. We used this together. I recall. Do you remember when when playtime was over? One of our parents would drive us to the other parent, and we would play multiplayer Game Boy games in the back seat with the cable connected until that one. Game- of them oh yeah, yeah, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. With the, with the um. I had the like translucent Game Boy. It was the yeah. newer Game Boy. Yeah. What was this Game Boy called? Versus this Game Boy. Oh, it, dude! So there was the really narrow, like Advance, the Advance, Game Boy Advance. The Advance, and then there was like the Advance SP, which was the foldable one. So the wide one was the Advance, and then the foldable. Yeah, dude, we existed in the nichest possible version of childhood. Like the only two years in human history where you could play like games with your friends on mobile devices, but you had to be connected by a cord. You had to be connected by a cord. It was the worst possible. And the board was like this long. Years old. No so one else had to deal with like, that. They put your hands out, and it's like, oh, shit, get closer, please. Oh, oh wait, it wait. so you're... bad. Yeah. I realize this is an experience that no one except, like, our very specific section of our generation will ever have. Because all of the people younger than us had wireless technology and backlights. All of the people older than us were just fucking outside like a kid should be. This caveman. <laughs> And then there was us with our Game Boy cable. Our childhood was terrible. It was so, so, so uh, supper time viewers, I'm going to do a quick Steve quiz here. It's Let's just a one question, it. and it is completely PG, so don't worry, everyone. Take your earmuffs off. Um, <laughs> Steve, do you remember my phone number when we used to call each other? Because I feel like you recently delivered this information to me. <laughs> Yeah, I think I do because this was also before the days of contact books. So, but well, there were remembering Rolexes. remembering, so remembering a friend okay. child uh, remembering a friend's childhood phone number is like that's a thing that a hundred years of people can do. I don't think that's that niche to us. But yeah, four nine five seven three two. I'm calling it. See if you reach him. I don't remember your number though. Why not, man? I'm hurt. I thought we were. Well, friends. I'm sorry. I've let you down so much. But guess what? <laughs> That was a paparazzi moment. Anyway. <laughs> that was great. Thank you for that. I'm the still trying to figure out what the difference is. 495 or something like that. 89 something. Yeah, it was. You can't just weasel your way out of doing the, the thing by just being like, anyway, what was some other stuff? <laughs> I can't tell you because that's still my parents' number. Your number, however, I don't think is still. Wait, can you say it and then like blank it out? No, I'm not going to do that kind of editing. <laughs> Absolutely not. And you don't remember it, so. <laughs> Well, uh-huh. was 495, right? No, not even close, dude. That was yours. Yours was 495. Oh, well, then just say mine. I did. 495-7323. Ah, oh, that was all I wanted. That's a great one, isn't it? It's a good number, too. It has a, it's got a ring to it. It's got a feel. It's got a ring to it, especially when you call. <laughs> That's funny. Uh, I still can't figure out the difference between a normal switch. Oh, same resolution, yep. smaller. A little bit sharper. Can Wait, some it's worth resolution, but sharper? Well, it's a smaller screen, same res, so it's a little sharper. Oh, okay. <laughs> totally handheld. Cannot be plugged into anything. Steve, can, can I make you the interviewee for a moment? Yeah, I'm ready. Is that a really cool-looking VR headset thing utilized for the drone or only us- usable with the drone? In other words, can you use it? Is that like a like Oculus Rift, or is it only a like proprietary drone headset? It's a proprietary drone headset. Yeah. Okay. So, but here's the great thing about that. So, interesting fact: as a super nerd, I probably should have a VR platform. I don't actually. I don't own any VR platforms. This is not even a VR platform in that it doesn't have like the surround screen when you put it on. It's just a really big HD screen in here. So it looks like you're sitting in front of like a 90 inch TV. Like you're five sure. feet from a 90 inch TV. 
it's great. So it's huge, wild, wide field of view. And it is, is uh, two different screens. So you've got a really nice, crisp view of things, right? And is it two different cameras coming out of the drone? Unfortunately not. It's not 3D. But... Uh, well, no, it wouldn't have to be 3D to have... Well, would it? I mean, couldn't your eye triangulate two different cameras? If, yeah, if, so if you had two different cameras, it would be 3D because then you'd have two points of view and that's how your mind creates three-dimensional things. But what's interesting about this headset is because it is made for the drones and holds the drone brand on it, when you plug it in and put it on and fly the drone, you can fly the drone with just your head. It's crazy. Oh, so you're like... Yeah. <laughs> You've got to make a sound so the camera will switch to your face. That's exactly what it's like. That was when you shot down another enemy drone. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, we don't do much shooting down drones. That's terribly illegal. You said don't do much, which implies that you do sometimes. Uh, but anyway. Throw the key out. The key out. So, so you fly these around, and, and yeah. when you turn your head, the drone turns, and you can just set it to fly forward. And so you can really just, it's like you're a bird, and wherever you look, you fly. It's incredible. It's a very freeing experience. So we talked about this maybe two years ago. Uh, no, I guess when, when did we last hang out? About a year and a half ago? Well, that last hang out. When did we? When was our, our circuit thirty three hang out? Didn't didn't we get like a didn't we get fish for lunch on Christmas? <laughs> I asked that genuinely. Uh, no, definitely not that. Yeah, fish no, for lunch on Christmas. Out. Yeah, Christmas oh. 2019. Oh, yeah, it wasn't Christmas. Well, it was the day after. Was it? The 26th? Yeah, it was the 26th, and then we okay. got for lunch. Well, right, right, right. We bought, like, yeah, but I, I that is true. We <laughs> it sounds time. weird, but it is true. But did you, yeah, well, did you get fish? I remember. I have no idea. It was like, South Park Seafood. Food. Also, there's a South Park Seafood ad. So <laughs> great seafood. Right, it's their normal. So right now in the, in the quarantine, companies are coming together. And they're kind of packaging their ads. So this one's a really. But the nice thing about this one is it's pretty logical because it's Bethesda, the video game company, South Park Seafood, a seafood restaurant in Oregon, and Amazon. Amazon, your neighborhood retailer, looking for something. It's sixty seven percent more expensive, but Steve will buy it. Amazon. <laughs> yeah, the ad. So we went there, but but the time before that, Steve and I had hung out, and we were talking about, hmm, what is it that we were talking about that I brought this up for? What were we were just talking about? The, was it VR headset related? Was it watches? Yes, it was. It was drone related. It was drone related. And so, I am so impressed with what you've done, and the fact that you've not only had a successful drone videography business, but also that you're pouring that straight whiskey straight into your glass like that. It's a <laughs> whiskey, it's tea, and I'm out. It's very sad. I'm out of tea, my 64 ounce thermos. I want to tell a story. <laughs> kind words. I appreciate it. Yeah, you're welcome. I want to tell a story about when I went to the liquor store the other day. By all means. So I go to the liquor store. By the way, Oregon is doing an excellent job of flattening the curve, oh. which matters. It does. Also, I want to give you a shout out here. You know, a month ago or more, Steve was more than that, raising the awareness about what was happening with coronavirus. Uh, you follow me on Twitter, don't you? I think I follow you everywhere, including into your room. And yeah. I keep this PG. Well, it wasn't like <laughs> it's everything that happens after that sentence that isn't PG. So that's your mind. Very good. It's very above board at that point. We read the Bible together. So um, anyway, Steve was like raising the alarm bells and I felt myself having a kind of negative reaction to that. It was like, this is, this is fear mongering. This is some kind of exploitive kind of way to like get people ginned up. And it wasn't because of what you were, well, it wasn't because of how you were saying it. It was because of what you were saying and the fact that it was scary and it wasn't coming from other sources, though God knows it should have been. And so I just want to give a shout out to you for your handling of that, because what seemed sort of emergency and, well, it was emergency, but what seemed sort of like reactive and, and reactionary was in the end 
quite a reasonable, even keeled analysis of what Bill Gates had been talking about, you know, just a few years prior. So yeah, credit it to you for that. Sucks that yelling a million people are going to die in the U.S. We should all stay at home like a madman in February. That should have been overblown. I was so very you, What brought this to your attention? I was very comfortable with that being an overblown tweet. Like if now, a month later, we were having the conversation that we are now on a video call and we were only going to have a week of quarantine and only 25,000 people were going to die because we handled it well, right? As opposed to how we actually handled it. I would love to be genuinely embarrassed by those tweets. I was really hoping that those tweets would just read like maniacal fever dreams. Unfortunately, the, the I think this is the most interesting thing about this crisis for me is that... Okay, but wait, I'm going to interrupt you, and I'm sorry, I don't want you to pick that back up, but I just saw a CNN news notification that said that the singer of Fountains of Wayne died. Oh. And he did that song, Stacy's Mom. <laughs> and I feel complex about this. I'm really sorry for the death of him, for his family and loved ones. But, like, what happened? And also, I haven't thought about that song, Stacey's Mom, in 20 years. And it just popped up in my purview. So this is sad, of course, but I just wanted to reference that. But back to you. Of you don't know what he died of. Away while I was talking about my predictions about the coronavirus. That's awful. Uh, but he also, read them, and he, he died. So, anyway, back to you. Whew, what a world we're living in. Yeah, like so many important artists are dying. and it, uh, oh. well, We don't know what he died of. Let's not, hold on. Because I called him the other day too. COVID-19. Yeah, tell me that it's not COVID-19. That'd be very surprising. Oh, fuck. It seems like it is. Yeah, of course, of course, of course. Wait, hold on. CNN.com is loading. It's my favorite website. Um, Adam Schlesinger, Fountain Wayne Singer, dead at 52 from COVID-19. Dude, at 52, that's, whew. dude, it's crazy what's happening. It should have been overblown. But by the time it gets to like people like me yelling like maniacs, you know someone in authority did not do their job, right? Like, so I had, how did you become aware? Like, talk to us about, talk to us, the listening public and me with my cool sweater, about how you were actually like conscious of this truly weeks prior to the like general, like group think knowledge. Okay, so one, I'm a super nerd, and I care deeply about existential risk. So, like, way back in the day, 2013, 14, 15, I read Will McAllister's book called Doing Good Better that's all about using data to effectively do altruistic things like charity. And that book was was what he wrote as he started a community called Effective Altruism. And effective altruists essentially are people who geek out about things that are very unlikely, but could be very bad if they happened. So you think about risk reward and trading and all this, right? People make money on the stock market when they balance risk and reward appropriately. You want a little tiny bit of risk and a whole lot of reward, right? Global, global like existential risks are the other way around. They're very, very unlikely to happen, but they're so, so bad if they do happen that they're worth paying attention to if, even if they're very unlikely. And so one of these classes of risks is like an asteroid hitting the earth, which we talk about sometimes and we're like, oh, it'd be very bad, but will that ever happen? Probably not. Sure. Uh, Yellowstone blowing up is one of these. Also, a pandemic happening is one of these. What's interesting about a pandemic happening is that it is like 20, 30, 40, 50 times more likely than any of the unlikely things that, that we worry about. Concretely. Right. So it's almost like conveniently fit into that category, but is... Right. Way, way, way more likely. It's not actually like... Here's the problem with humans, though, is that we, we, we actually spend some time thinking about all of these problems. So like volcanoes, we kind of know what to do to do early warning systems, earthquakes, tornadoes, hurricanes. We have ways to get people out of the way of those emergencies. Asteroids, we have like, we know if an asteroid is going to hit the earth and we have some contingency plans already in place if one were to actually be an urgent problem. But we spend about the same amount of resources on the like asteroid problem as a Culture as a planet, as we do on the pandemic problem, which is not good because the pandemic problem is much, 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 much more likely, like sure. 20, 50 times more likely. So what you find out, I guess, when you become someone who, who cares about these things and spends enough time thinking about nonsense that you're aware of those statistics is you go, oh, we should spend more money on pandemics. Bill Gates also happens to be one of those nerds. And so he watched a TED talk or he gave a TED talk that I had watched a couple years ago at TED. I think this was maybe 2016, I want to say. But up until and literally the February of the conferences. What? 
Is Ted the mothership of the conferences? Yeah, Ted is the like when you say Ted without the X. Yeah, so this is the this is the mothership, right? It's the main event that happens every year in Canada. It started in California in the eighties. Canada? Yeah. It happens in Vancouver. It used to be in California. They moved it to Vancouver because some people can't travel to the US for political reasons. Very fair. Yeah, so they host this big time elitist conference now once a year where the global elites that also go to Davos come and talk about their ideas. And so the one of the, one of those presentations was Bill Gates talking about a possible pandemic because when he started his foundation and dealt with polio, etc., and sort of built on the work that Jimmy Carter did, what he discovered there is is our problem is not necessarily the technology, it's the distribution and the systems we have for people addressing the problem. And so with polio, like it's, it's about healthcare work and the people doing that healthcare work in communities. With a possible pandemic, it's about research speed, it's about manufacturing of vaccines and this sort of thing. So that's what his talk was about. And it wasn't really as alarmist as I guess it should have been, but it still drove a lot of people to do some work. So this talk, which had a million views in February of 2020, I just wanna add one million views. It, not many people had watched it. Bill Gates gave it a couple of years ago. No one really gave it a ton of thought. The only outcomes from that conference and from his, his press that he did back in a couple of years ago was an organization called CEPI getting founded at Davos in 2017, which was the year before I went, actually. So the global goals and CEPI and a couple of these other things that are about addressing climate change and also addressing pandemics were all sort of kicked into motion the year before I got the opportunity to go and see those those things all in person. And so I just happened to be exposed to this culture in this world. And like, I was aware it, enough of it that when like Ebola happened and when Zika happened and that sort of thing, I spent some time reading articles and I was like, oh, okay, that won't be a big deal. And I moved on with my life like everybody else does. However, the problem with COVID is when you go and you read a couple articles, you realize very fast from any of the numbers in any of the reporting that this is unlike anything that's ever happened. It, it spreads in air, it spreads to other people, and it does not let you know that you have it until you've already given it to two other people. And so... Well, hold on, I want to jump in here. It does not spread in air, it spreads via droplets. So yeah, you, yeah, yeah, right. So if you... This is more I was talking to a friend of mine who is a respiratory therapist who works in the hospitals, who, to his credit, his name is Ian Clark, I want to give him a shout out, the UNM hospital like Instagram page today posted a photo with him and a, co- a colleague of his, you know, seven feet apart. With oh, face mask on. But him and I were talking the other day and he was saying that obviously this is very insidious and horrible and nothing I'm saying is meant to diminish the severity, intensity, and absolute like serious approach we should all have to this. Yeah. But the reason I want to interrupt and I apologize to do it, but it's because, you know, you're not going to walk into a cloud of this. Okay, so this is what's actually quite interesting, is that there's not a there's not a ton of data in the U.S. yet. Studies are just beginning because enough people have it that we can do studies, and it's been just the last few weeks. But several studies came out already from Europe and China, and, and actually when I was doing my research in February, there was already a study out, and one published a week later that indicated people can get it at least six feet away, in some cases up to 15 feet away, not from people coughing or from other things, but from people breathing. Now, of course, that's not likely, nor is it the highest case of transmission most transmission is respiratory droplets when someone coughs and you're within three feet of them for more than 10 minutes. It's like 90% of, of like actual transmission. However, there are edge cases where people have been proven to have gotten it by riding on the opposite side of like a public city bus from someone who had it, didn't know it, didn't have any symptoms and was just breathing, Okay, which is crazy. So those sort of facts combine with where we were when I finally realized it was a big deal is it was not a big deal in China for February and, or sorry, for December and January, right? It was in China. Everything was fine. No one had really traveled outside of the country or shown any symptoms. There were a few other nearby countries that had gotten one or two. There was precedent for that, like Ebola spread to a couple countries unexpectedly. There was a great chance we could still contain it. And if the world's systems operated the way they did two years ago, which they don't anymore, we probably would have contained it. it Prior have. to this cancellation of pandemic? Yeah. So a couple things important. went horribly wrong. A couple things went horribly wrong. One, China's shutdown did not effectively capture the virus, and it got to basically a dozen other countries. And at that point, it was a done deal. Because if it's going to get to other countries and infect even one other person who travels, right, the, 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 the effect occurs. Yeah. 
uh, at that point, there are too many jurisdictions and too many decision makers to like fix the problem efficiently, especially if not everyone agrees that it's an urgent problem. And because the the like global enforcer of this is an urgent problem had been handicapped, basically cut off at the knees two years ago when the Trump administration decided to shut a lot of the, those essential operations down. Like, for example, the U.S. funded everything that happened in response right. to Ebola when no one thought it was a problem. Right. And that's why Ebola did not become a problem. The U.S. did nothing in response to COVID-19, like next to nothing, because, because there was not political support, but also because there wasn't a structure in place anymore. And yeah, so the world operates differently now than it did then. And also this was a much bigger threat. Than Ebola. So, you know, it's funny you say that because I, my politics are pretty left and I won't go deep on that, but I'll just say that that being said, I had the pleasure of having dinner with Ron Klain a couple weeks ago, who was the Ebola czar. Oh, no. Uh, and he is a brilliant human being, and it was a delight to get to talk to somebody with that level of acuity, reasonable, thoughtfulness, you know, education, mindfulness, etc., such that I was sitting there in Ron Klain's house in, in, in Maryland and having dinner talking about, like, what was lacking, and this was about a year and a half ago, talking about what was lacking in our current circumstances. And he, they're in, you know, in the presence of someone who is dedicated and has remained dedicated to trying to solve problems in, in, in certain ways, but particularly when it comes to the Ebola virus. I mean, he was chosen to be the Ebola czar as he became. That wasn't the term that was used out the gate, obviously, but because of your point, or, or to your point, Steve, because of the need to have a previous America that unfortunately no longer exists from a federal government perspective, show up, you know, things, things were more contained than they ever could be now. Turns out, yeah, the, the, there are like some systems that we need stability and predictability in that are currently being run by a system that gets overhauled every four years. That's maybe not the greatest way to have those set up especially when it comes to existential risks. And so I think there's, there's a, I think the most important thing that will come out of this crisis is that the post-World War II era systems we set up to handle global problems like this may get their own governing body that does not have a regime change every four years. Because having, having them under the jurisdiction of a U.S. president and the U.S. budget, discretionary budget, is, is super not smart. No, and the thing is, like, we have certain body politics that support, you know, even prior to 2016 in this country, the idea of an organization such as NATO, you know, something that is multinational, that is not directly created in response to an active threat, but is more contingency based and, and mitigation focused. And if we had more of that on every level, I mean, I understand why people feel a reticence to support something like that militarily because nobody wants War, violence. Global you know. military doesn't sound like a great idea. Global State Department, maybe. Right, right. The idea that, like, the reason that we are in this position of quarantine is because of a uncoordinated and ego driven problem yeah. is more than enough evidence to show that we need to have people who are not coming from a place of, you know, the, the luck of the population, or the luck of an electoral college vote, and instead, People who are experts, I mean, you know, Anthony Fauci and these people who are actually experts are still captured to some degree by the circumstance they find themselves in. Yeah, and I, I'm no expert on, like, how who is governed or, or anything like that. The WHO seems like it's handled this okay, but I know that way more American resources would have been thrown at it. And that's maybe not good that American resources need to be thrown at it. In an increasingly globalized world, maybe sure. we can't have this dependence on the U.S. anymore because it's been like 70 years since we've won the last I mean, year. if we have, I think it should be a percentage-based analysis. Like, yeah. in other words, it would be a mix of population percentage. I mean, and I'm not... Yeah. Right so, so maybe there's some sort of representation, participation, representational participation every country can have in these. Okay, did, did Ebola czar have suggestions or feedback or what did he think about what's happening? And does that, I mean, this was a long, I had, I had, had him a year and a half ago. So this is prior to this. I wish that I was that in the know. No, he's also currently running Joe Biden's campaign. So he's pretty, or not running, but, but involved with. Yeah. So, no, but this was June. I misheard. I thought you said a couple weeks ago. I wish. I would love that. It would have been amazing. Like right before quarantine. I was like, you lucky. 
Although, you know, what? this is a good reminder is I will, I have no reason to believe I'd get a response, but maybe I should, I do have his email. I'll send him an email. You should ask. Yeah. Ask him for his take on this and tell him if he wants to talk about it, he can come on my show. <laughs> I would love that. I would love that. Enjoy. So what do you do to keep yourself happy, healthy, and whole in this process? Part of the reason I'm hosting the show is because I needed a reason to cut my work off at 5 p.m. every single day. This is a really good, like, I feel a little excited when it's a 5.30 call instead of a 5, and I like get to work an extra half hour, but I still know I'm going to end my day when I need to end my day. Sure. Working from home, that's the hardest thing, I think, is that, like, there's this temptation to, like, oh, I'll get more done, and it it only devolves into self-defeating practice. Sure. Yeah. How about you? I mean, I'm in a lucky position where I'm maintaining a paycheck and I am, for whatever reason, cut from the kind of cloth where I enjoy being at home. You know, I also enjoy being outside. But for me, the idea of spending time just sort of reading and sleeping in to a little bit of a degree is, is really nice. And, you know, something that I've talked with you about before is the idea that I think working from home is the is the future of most occupations. Now, obviously, I just want to take credit to, or not take credit, I want to give credit to the healthcare workers who like cannot do such a thing from home. Yeah, Some sure. people can, but the vast majority need to be there physically in the close space of people who are dealing with tremendous medical fallout yeah. and, and, and pain and disease and, and illness. And so for me... I'm in a very unique and special position. For me, I've been playing some video games and reading. I'm reading three books right now. I'm reading, oh, reading? Um, Kafka on the Shore by Haruki okay. Murakami. Okay. A fabulous book. This one is sort of my fun brain game plus like relaxation book. Okay. I'm reading Why We Are Polarized by Ezra Klein. Oh, cool. It's a fabulous book. Ezra is the founder of Vox, right? Correct. And second only to my immaculate host here, Steve Morocco, I would say that Ezra Klein is the single best interviewer I've ever had the pleasure of listening to. I don't come anywhere close to Ezra Klein for interviewing people. Well, you're sweet, but you're doing more. That's that compliment. (laughs) Ezra Klein is so willing to ask tough questions without alienating his guests. Yeah. Oh, it's such a skill. It is such a skill. It's a tightrope. So he does that with, Grace and Aplomb. And then the third book I'm reading is Esquire's Style Guide. It's oh, called, cool. And it is just such a treat. It's called The Art of Style. Yeah. And it's, they get into like a molecular breakdown of, you know, what are different like ways that cotton is, you know, cotton is, is spun or is produced. I mean, what is different clothing fabrics? What is it between tweed and flannel and, so I have this delightful mix of like kind of mild scientific analysis through the form of what is style, a delightful brain journey with Haruki Murakami, and a very pertinent and intense analysis of our current state of politics. Very cool. Very cool. Is the fashion book giving you the button down advice? <laughs> well, the fashion book would surely call out, and not in a good way, the unbuttoning of it. But, you know... In this Zoom call, I don't even know if you could, you would have not even. There are no fashion rules on Zoom. None at all. Well, as my dear friend Tom Vogt always says, is that really fashion is what you can own and what you feel good in. So it's not really about what other people say. It's about what you feel good wearing. And as long as you're confident in it because it makes you happy, then what little, you know, little else matters. What what are you, what are the takeaways you're getting from these conversations? Like, what is the state of affairs of our world that we're all in here together? So, so Mick, I don't know if you know this, but I've been excited to talk with you about this all day because you, fine, happen to be here. Maybe I'll just leave it like this. You happen to be number nine. You are the last single digit uh, dinner supper time that I will have. The final, the final single digit supper time I will ever have. Okay. I'm Number flattered, one. honored, and I'm currently putting in order to get a plaque made. It's extremely high pressure. My invitation to you is, did you watch the first one? No. Okay, so the first one, I explained that you were the, in, you were the inspiration in the first place for Supper Time. And I am I so flattered. It's, it's shocking that my ego didn't pick up on its existence. 
I mentioned that on my Instagram story, and I think I, when I asked you to be on the show, I mentioned it sort of offhand. But I wasn't clear what was going on. I just so when you were so asinine to suggest to me that people couldn't have genuine connection or feel like they were actually having togetherness time digitally, that can't be true. I delighted. Happened. I said, I, th there's no way you can take your opinion and go straight to hell. And so... <laughs> I'm here now. It's pretty this cool. Is my expression of that. And I, great. I think I'm learning a few things about ways in which you were right and ways in which you were wrong. Uh, and I will continue to learn them. So what I would like to do before I give you my full report on the first eight episodes is invite you to be guest number 99 as well. Are you I would be flattered. Yes. You, you will be my first repeat guest on the show at 99. And then during the hundreds, we'll have a couple more repeat guests, I imagine. Oh, yes. I would like that. At, at the very least, I expect to be 999. Uh, 999. Yes, 999 as well. So I don't know if you noticed, but when I'm publishing Supper Times, I'm putting them up with many zeros in front. <laughs> That's good. I, lo I love the, the expectation of a beautiful future. It turns out I have 26,000 days alive, probably. Most okay. people do. And I figure I'm going to eat that calculation? the majority of them. Hey, Siri, what's 365 times 80? 365 times 80 is 29,200. 29,200, sorry. So like ballpark-ish. Like so assuming that's that you'll live to be 116? No, 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 no. I'm just saying this is the number of days in my life, right? So we probably oh, got sure. like not not mid -20, on -ish. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we probably got mid-20,000-ish left, right? Whatever it is, whatever the number is. I, I feel like... <laughs> <laughs> the five digits is so ballsy given that, right? Given that the maximum <laughs> is using only a quarter of those five digits. <laughs> you know, you got to dream a little. I, I figured five digits was like... I expect to be 999,000. So you will be, every time we have all nines across the board, you will be the guest. I love that. I was hoping for the 69, but it's fine. <laughs> Um, so okay, PG, right? PG. Nobody will catch that. Do you know also you have the dubious distinction of being the first person who ever explained to me what 69 is? <laughs> Wait, well. <laughs> Let the audience know it was all through words and not through actions. Yeah, thank God. Thank God. I was traumatized. Well, I was traumatized been. enough learning it just through words. I definitely didn't need a demo. I, no thanks. Well, you, you, you know, after, after that, you ain't never found satisfaction again. So tell oh me more God. about what you learned that I was right about and what you've learned that I was wrong about. Okay, so what you were right about is there is obviously some difference between having a like digital call and an in-person call. That's the only thing I'm right about is that there is a difference. <laughs> yeah, but that's where the that's where your rightness ends. I'm being generous, okay? Let me be generous. Well, what kind of difference? <laughs> so I think there's, I mean, there's some obvious things like there's, less that I can see in other people's posture and in, in the nonverbals and that sort of thing. Cause it's kind of just what's in frame is really all you can draw conclusions with. Sure. But if they're like nervously wringing their hands out of frame, who knows? Um, or if <laughs> I knew it, you've been nervously wringing your hands out of frame the whole time. Most people I feel like show most of that on their face though. So it's not a huge deal. Yeah. See, I can tell you're nervously. <laughs> and I'm fine. I hope the camera switched to you there because that's a I'm fine, everyone. <laughs> to that, obviously. But I, I honestly think I've been surprised that the majority of these conversations, because of how reliable Zoom calls are, just to shout out Zoom as if it were an ad. And also <laughs> Morrowind, uh, The Elder Scrolls Three, also Amazon.com, a, a, a global marketplace. <laughs> Don't forget Animal Crossing, dude. Animal Crossing, a game <laughs> for the quarantine. Yeah, so because Zoom seems to work pretty well, most people have their Wi-Fi set up now. I think video calls have a different quality than they used to even a year ago. So Agreed. This I is a pixelated Skype of our 10-year-old past. So nice, actually, that the majority of the time when you're having a conversation like this now, you can almost zone out and feel like you're just talking to the person sitting across the I've room. been zoning out. I haven't listened to anything you've said. <laughs> so you get my <laughs> point, right? It's, it's possible to think you're just in a conversation and to stop thinking I'm on a video call which is amazing. So you get all the benefits of like seeing people's facial expressions and having a conversation with them and being a part of an experience together without necessarily breathing and then <laughs> interacting with their droplets. Right, those droplets, those respiratory droplets, don't want them. They will get you, they will get you. 
Ebola czar would tell you that. Res- 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 respiratory. Well, he'll tell me. He'll tell me that. He'll tell you that. You won't tell anyone else. Um, well, I mean, yeah, this is my homie. So that is. Uh, th- those are a few of the observations. A couple things that I've been surprised by that I didn't expect are that. Um, Okay, so as a photographer, all of the time I have to deal with people like freaking out when they're being recorded in any way. I've recently filmed advertisements with coworkers for ads and campaigns that we're doing and products we're selling, where the moment a camera is there on recording, they'll get all nervous and clammy and weird. It's just very sad. The really nice thing about this like recording icon here on Zoom is that no one seems to notice it after the first minute. They like forget that we are technically on camera. And I think that's part in because it's part because like we're, we feel like we're looking at each other and not at a webcam. Sure. But it, it's also part because like there's not the traditional like setup that makes you nervous of like a camera. So that's really cool. Being able to actually have a recorded experience that doesn't make people weird. I don't have to do too much work as an interviewer to make people feel comfortable. And so that I, I think is a really, really cool benefit of video calls in this context. And for that reason, I've had conversations that I didn't honestly think were possible in the last eight episodes, especially in recorded form. Even if I was recording a podcast, I think they would be more, more cognizant of recording a podcast than they are of recording a video call like this, which is surprising because you, you'd think just recording audio, people wouldn't notice or mind at all. But I think if we had microphone setups and that sort of thing, people would really, really react badly to that compared to this. Right, or may not react badly, but react, react more. Yeah, um, sure. I mean, the thing is like, it's easy to just get lost in your eyes. Wow, right. wow. And, I think you might have just one too many of the. Uh, what were you saying? <laughs> Wait, me complimenting you means I'm drunk, then that means that you're just not handsome. So you should just assume I'm sober. No, so like the point is that like it's easy to just get into that like beautiful up and down flow of conversation that when you're looking at someone, like I feel like I'm looking at you even though I'm not. If we had microphones in front of our faces, even if we were in the same room, there would be a different sort of outside element being introduced in. Definitely that. Yeah. So I think that has been the most surprising outcome of starting to have suppers with people is that they feel more like suppers than I expected. And I've actually been able to eat during some of the episodes, which has been fun. I love that. I have questions. What do you think? This is the most important question of all. As Episode nine. What do you think of the first eight so far? First of all, how many did you watch just out of your own curiosity? I honestly had no expectation you would watch any of them, so I'm surprised you watched any. I only watched the one with Trevor. <laughs> awesome. And then two, what do you think? What do you think so far? Does this, are, are you, were you wrong about the ability to connect with other people online or not? So, I don't think I was wrong that this is always a, it depends on the audience. If the audience is you and I here together, this is a poor substitution, but it's the best substitution we can get. For now. If the goal is for other people, well, what could be better? Because this is a time in our lives where technology is sufficient enough to provide quality images and video and audio that is listenable and isn't like, you know, the first like film reel ever of like that horse, like jumping and people are like, well, we can do like 16 frames a second. It's what We've literally every illustrator uses to draw horses. Every illustrator, whenever they need to draw a horse, they use that. That's the thing. People right. need to draw horses. It's crazy. So, you know, we've come a long way since then. Now we can, um, we're, we're a far metropolis, you know, but I think this is a wonderful tool. I just don't think that it should be. I think they're two different things. Hmm. I don't think the one isn't a replacement for the other. They're just like, it's good that we do this. This is good. I, I love. So before, before our conversation gets too lost in the lore and it's too far gone to, to remember what you actually said, what was the context that we were talking about? intimacy and in-person conversations and whether or not in-person versus it was on Twitter. Was it not? What was the, it was. And I, well, I mean, we'd have to look that up. Um, I, you made a comment, which you should clarify about the idea that you felt like either you were saying that simply people are 
capable of having equally intimate dialogues in virtual scenarios, or you are kind of hypothesizing that that should be possible, even if you don't know if it is. And I'm of the opinion that we should never choose, I guess we should never choose this mm. if we have the alternative. In other words, if you and I were in Colorado Springs together and we weren't in a quarantine, and you said, I'd love to catch up, but I'm pretty busy. Why don't we just do a quick Zoom call? I would find that problematic. I think people need to spend more time making time for others and less time making time for themselves, unless what they're doing is distinctly important and productive and clear. But like, I think that we, it is incumbent on us to feel connected to this living experience to make time for other people. However, in the absence of in the quarantine, in the geographical distance that separates us regardless of an epidemic or not, this is a beautiful and delightful way to connect. I agree. That's my thought. So, so, so I can clarify. Yeah, I, I remember us having that discussion. And I think I referenced my experience with TED videos and this sort of thing. So I think, and I've talked about in other episodes this, that there are inherent like, benefits, right? Like you said, if other people are trying to watch our conversation, this is definitely the best way to do this. It feels the most intimate and the most personal and the most lifelike, right? You can't have 10,000 right. people sit here next to us. Uh, and if we had an audience of 10,000 people in person, it would be remarkably worse than this, right? It right. would actually be very difficult for them to understand what we're saying and we'd have to have microphones and all this nonsense. So that said, this is probably the best way for 10,000 people to be a part of our conversation. But for one-on-one -on -one conversations, yeah, may maybe it's different. I... I do wonder if if that's more of a social norm that is changing now or if that's an actual, if the first principles are there, right? Like, th so there's something to be said for like, I don't know, some of the nonverbals that I mentioned, maybe like just the shared context of being in the same room and smelling the same food being made if you're sharing a meal, whatever, whatever the case is. Maybe there's some like real value there, but part of me thinks that maybe that's just Artificial? Yeah, I think that's made up. I think it's social and, and cultural, and I think it's actually better than in-person experience. I know, how is, I know how this is a popular cultural point. I know that people are surprised that I feel this way. But I really genuinely, <laughs> and not just speaking as someone who also enjoys being home during the quarantine, but as, as someone who's really enthusiastic about digital technology and the way it enables us to connect, I think there are ways that we can connect more authentically with each other this way that that we can't with an in-person in-person connection like for example i you know if if we were sharing a space and sharing a meal like we would have to agree on on where we're going to eat where we're going to go what we're going to do how we're going to sit and who we're going to be there with and all of these other things whereas like this context i could have a person right here who's not talking during the call who's keeping me company and who is just here to be here and they're doing their own work on their laptop or whatever. I could have just made a meal in the other room and I could be eating whatever I want here. I could be sitting on the couch or in any other context. But all of that is true in person. None of that is true in person. In person, we have to collaboratively make a decision about what we both want and what works for both of us. Wait, Where, you couldn't have somebody sitting next to you doing what they're doing. You couldn't be cooking a meal. Like, how is that not true? In so the only thing we have to coordinate on a digital conversation like this is it happening at the same time. It has to be synchronous so that we can respond to each other. And that's it. The rest of it, we don't have to coordinate. If we are in person, there's so much else we have to coordinate. I don't, I'm not tracking. The like what? We got to make sure we both like the restaurant we're going to is maybe a concrete example. Isn't that a treat in and of itself? Yeah, but it's, it's also different. Like it's not necessarily better or worse depending on the context and the person, but I think it, it definitely opens up more options digitally. So that's why I think digitally is better because, because we can both choose to coordinate those things digitally, <laughs> if we want to, but we don't have to. I mean, so I agree that this creates more opportunity, but at what, at what, like, not at what cost? That's the, There's the, literally no cost. I think that's the thing. Is no, that no, but not at, that's why I said not at what cost. It, it's, it's that at, at what sacrifice of value. So, like, can I have more of these kinds of, like, very 
direct connection moments a day through digital means, sure. But like, I would much rather spend, now again, separating the audience perspective, like uh -huh. let's say the audience. Sure. Totally. Um, I would much rather be in a restaurant with you, you know, eating calamari and, and cracking open shrimp shells and, you know, talking to a waiter and, and seeing the like flickering light of a candle and whatever it is like to me, that holistic sensory experience mm. is unquestionably light years more enjoyable than whatever two dimensional experience would otherwise be the case. So here's what I want to challenge you on. Cause I, I think that that is a function of cultural design and the purpose we've put around shared experiences over the course of the last several thousand years for eating together, right? When you think of a really pleasant restaurant experience, that's a function of literally thousands of years of design. Sure. Of people that's putting it in purpose book. Yeah. And so it totally makes sense that that doesn't exist for the digital space yet because it doesn't. Because we haven't had thousands of years to think about it. Literally just this year, Zoom got good enough to have a reasonable human connection on a digital video, right? But think about now, 2,000 years in the future, when people have been engaging both virtually and personally for as long as they have been personally. Maybe are you, are you, are you, are you, like in Star Trek, like you can order a meal out of the like device, which I'm ashamed. Are you going, are you going to, in 10,000 years, choose to share physical space with someone and possibly get the coronavirus 20, third version from them whatever whatever version we're on 23 steve's on the fucking upswing of knowledge so no no no. what it, what is what is like what are the risks of sharing a physical space with someone and will you take those risks if there are no benefits over sharing a digital space with someone so think about it. you if you now get to have such an intentionally designed experience at a restaurant that's designed for video calls or holography or whatever the technology happens to be. I think digital sharing of social experiences is much better and just needs better design. I, I, I think that like in a theoretical sense, that's true, but in a practical sense, that's almost impossible. I'm not going to ever say actually impossible. Okay. But like, what seems impossible about it? It requires too many sensory inputs to be an actual Essentially, what I would want is everything to perfectly emulate a shared physical experience, but for, I don't know, the transmission of disease. It seems like we'd be more likely to come up with a way to prevent the transmission of disease than we would to come up with a perfect hologram version of that, a perfect like, synonymous version of that. Yeah. Like, no, I think, I think people will opt for digital experiences 99% of the time in less than 20 years because you can disappear at any moment. You can be in another place at any moment. There's, it's like teleportation instead of transit. And so I think... Do not enjoy... Like, uh, what is your... No, really it's not that I don't enjoy it. I love it. But I think it has unnecessary burdens that people accept tacitly. Because what are the burdens that are worth it? You've got to be there in person. You've got to drive there. You've got to transit there. You have to... What are the burdens that are worth it? They're not worth it. I think what if we can, sex? what? What about sex? Well, uh, sex aside, I think sex is obvious. Oh, 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 no. Because there's a whole path that leads to you intimacy. No, 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 no. Okay, okay. Actually, maybe you're right. Like there's, I, and that's a whole very in, intense side culture thing. But yeah, no, I think there's a good chance that people who like, for example, have to be in long distance relationships will have digital analogs physical bodies that they inhabit. There are a lot of good sci-fi movies about that, right? Sure. But I think we're closer than we think we are to those sort of experiences. Um, and, and that's part of what I want to explore with the series, because I think we're already there for some experiences, like sharing a meal together. I think we're already there. Like we're 99% of the way toward having a pleasant meal time. We don't need holography. We don't need replacement of physical senses to make it better than the in-person experience. So, so, I mean, and I, I have adored this experience and have adored talking to you and have delighted in the entire presentation. The the Getting the Google, the shorts, all of it. Yes. Uh, right. My, my cool, cool, cool cameras. I don't feel like this is in any way it is a personal experience. Okay. Yeah. No. That's, no, that's not to say it isn't good. Yeah. And no, I want to get it. I just disagree. I would rather That's have done this than fly to Portland. 
as someone who recently spent a day in Portland, just a day, I flew there for a day. And I had this exact same experience with you. I shared a meal. We were together for one hour. And then I left. And you find I, this equally popular? I, or, I would well, much rather do this. I would much rather do this than that. Wait, well, because of what? The cost and the, the physical, mental, and financial cost of the, of the travel? Yeah. Okay, but if all things were made equal and there was no cost, would you still prefer this over sitting next to each other eating – uh, what were you clam chatter together? Always a fish shop. <laughs> it's always seafood. <laughs> yeah, I think so. Really? Are you I sure would, about that? I'm not, so, like, if you lived next door and we could walk across the street, yeah, but I just said if you take away the cost, time, money, etc. I think it would be a draw. Well, why? I don't think there's enough of a difference for it to be remarkably different as an experience. Uh, I would definitely choose to have this call in another place. Again, like if we're taking out all of the like transit time set up, whatever, I would rather have my laptop somewhere more comfortable with better food. <laughs> but I don't think having my laptop there versus having you there would remarkably change the quality of the conversation. Do you think that that is a general truth that people are unwilling to accept? Or do you think that is an oddity that you feel? I think it's an undesigned experience. I think it is an opportunity for intentional social and cultural design. I think it's a chance for us to innovate for each other and make businesses. Well, why would we choose that? Because there are so many advantages. Like, I don't have to fly to Portland, Nick. <laughs> well, no, no, okay. But the thing is, like, Think about it. If we can design an experience that's as pleasant as this, any seafood that you happen to feel like eating recently, if we can design a, an experience that's as pleasant and well designed as actually sharing a meal together, but we also don't have to do any transit, because the, the hard fact of life is that that hypothetical case doesn't exist. There is always a cost for having a conversation with someone. And so but there's, but there's also a payoff. Oh, yeah, totally. But if the payoff can be the same, regardless, I don't have to fly to Portland. I mean, I, I, are you are you are you asking this question in every conversation? No, just yours. And this will happen again in episode ninety nine. We we had to rehab this conversation. Okay, I would love that. But even if you don't ask this explicitly, I would love for you to keep teasing this out because okay. I can't imagine a world in which I would be equally satisfied with the kind of digital experience, even if we implemented all of the things we're discussing, bar like a matrix esque you know, goo pod yeah. with every single sensory experience was one to one. I can't imagine this being not, not this. This yeah, is yeah. you would really need every sensory experience to be one to one. You wouldn't be happy with a video call version of this where you could hear me well in a nice restaurant. Well, no, I mean, not again. It depends on the purpose, right? In this purpose, and maybe I'm being redundant here. But like in this purpose, I'm perfectly delighted. Yeah, but no, I would never choose if I had the option. Yeah. And there was no audience involved. Right. And there was no cost. Right. I would always choose the in-person. Interesting. I adore you, and I've enjoyed this conversation so much. I am so grateful as well. I'm about to go. There's a restaurant that opened after years of preparation, the week of our shutdown. But, like, right around the cusp where they weren't sure what was going to happen, like, to their credit, well... I guess if they'd been as aware of you and Bill Gates, they wouldn't have been so shocked, but nonetheless. And they have this incredible barbecue restaurant. And I ordered a whole chicken about a week and a, a week ago, and it was the best chicken I've ever eaten in my life. And I'm now, at, in 10 minutes, it's 6.20 here, going to go pick up a rack of ribs, St. Louis style, with a side of mashed potatoes and pickles. It's going to be life-changing. That sounds delicious. I hope you enjoy it. I want to leave our audience with a thought. I'm ready. We roll up to 6 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. My favorite author in the last year overall writ large has been John Green. We've talked about John Green before you and I, Steve. His podcast, The Anthropocene Reviewed, is fabulous. One of the best. I'm going to link that in the show notes. Absolutely. And um, to the point, he told a joke to Roman Mars from 99% Invisible on a episode in which Roman Mars interviewed John Green. And the joke has to do with a moth. 
I'm going to leave it for the listeners to check out. But in dire times and in strange moments like we find ourselves in, I would recommend listening to Roman Mars' most recent podcast about describing things in his house, which sounds absolutely obtuse and boring, but is quite a delight. And I would listen to John Green's podcast and just reach out to people and, you know, hang out with Steve. His, his hair is growing out beautifully. Yeah, it looks pretty good. Almost as good as my, like, I am a professor. My J.R.R. Tolkien look is coming along quite well. Really, that's what you're crafting. It's a J.R.R. Tolkien look. I understand. Or taking a picture of a hobbit. (laughs) Amazing. Incredible. Thank you for talking, Mick. What a joy. (laughs) I'll I'll go now before the paparazzi gets me. Farewell. Farewell.